Good morning. It is good to be here with you. Um, my name is Jen Grafius, and I work at Azusa Pacific University in the School of Theology. Uh, but Peter and I go way back um, to a time when Peter was a college student and I was a youth director at a church in Glendora. And uh, we really needed an intern. And Peter came in and he became one of the family really quickly. And uh, so we've had lots of adventures together. I'm pretty sure we went to Camden together, right? And worked with um, Extreme Makeover Home Edition. <laughs> We did not intend to do that when we were there, but surprise, the uh, video cameras were there, and <laughs> there we were. But there's lots of stories I could tell, and I won't. Uh, but it really is a joy to be here and to see how God has worked in Peter's life and in his family's life. And um, we've always known, at, at least when I was at Glenkirk, that God was up to something in Peter's life, and now seeing him pastor this church is a real joy. And... Um, so today we're going to dive into Philippians. I know you're working through a theme of saints together. And so today, let's turn to Philippians 3, beginning in verse 4. And hear the word of God. It says this, Even though I, too, have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. But not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. A good text for today. So Matt Emmons had the gold medal in sight. He was one shot away from claiming victory in the 2004 Olympic 50-meter three-position rifle event. He didn't even need a bullseye to win. His final shot just needed to hit the target. Normally, the shot he made would have received a score of 8.1, which was more than enough for a gold medal. But in what was described, as an extremely rare mistake in elite competition, Emmons fired at the wrong target. Standing in lane two, he fired at the target in lane three. And his score for a good shot at the wrong target? Zero. Instead of a medal, Emmons ended up in eighth place. So it doesn't matter how accurate you are, if you're aiming at the wrong goal. So as we consider this sermon series, Saints Together, my first question for all of us is, what goal are we aiming at? As we live out our day-to-day -day lives, what do we value most? And what are we willing to lay it all down for? This is basically what the Apostle Paul is asking us in today's text. Paul understands what it means to aim at things like prestige and honor. 
Our passage begins with some autobiographical data about the apostle, who mentions his status and achievements within the Jewish tradition. And in many cultures in the Mediterranean world, one's social status was determined by honor. So such honor can be one of two things. It can be ascribed honor, which is a status given to people um, due to the reputation of their family and ancestry. It's about who somebody, was, who somebody was by birth. And there was very little that people could do to change this position. They were just born into whatever ascribed honor they had or didn't have. But then there's another kind of honor. Another, this other kind is acquired honor. A person could Im improve their social status through their achievements, whether that was academic or economic. It was an earned status, something that they worked for. And as Paul tells his own story, we come to find that he was of enviable status both in, socially in both categories. He was kind of a, a rock star. He was born into a certain degree of honor. He presents himself in Philippians 3.5 as literally an eighth day one regarding circumcision. He is a, of the people of Israel, and he belongs to the tribe of Benjamin, which made him a Hebrew of Hebrews. This means for that, those who cared about a family's heritage, there was no doubt that Paul had some pedigree. And as a true Israelite, he was distinguished from Gentiles or God-fearers who were non-Jewish sympathizers of Judaism. He was really a blue-blooded insider. As for honors that he had acquired, Paul presents himself as, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Pharisees were known for their affection of the Torah and their strict law observance. So Paul had formally persecuted followers of Jesus because they, just as Jesus himself, propagated a somewhat liberal interpretation of certain commandments, and there were some Jewish people who were just not having it. Paul had taken pride in his ethical blamelessness, according to which he had gained righteousness. Paul was quite the man. And in this text, there's a moment, much like the 2004 Olympics with Matt Emmons, where we find out that all of that honor is just aiming at the wrong thing. This is not the stuff that matters in God's kingdom. Paul states that he regards all attributes of honor, that which he was born into and that which he had earned, as loss, even rubbish. The Greek used here, it actually means dung. But Paul should know that you shouldn't talk about poop in the Bible. This was crazy. This went against all of the thinking of the ancient Mediterranean world. And honestly, it goes against our thinking today. All the honor in the world, all the honor that the world can hold, pales in comparison to the overwhelming power of knowing Christ. In a world where we feel like we have everything right at our fingertips, in a world where we can push a button and have just what we need in the moment, this is a very simple and yet deeply profound truth. Because, you know, I came to Peter's church today, and as I was thinking about being here, I thought I really wanted to preach a good sermon that could impress you very much, so that you knew that Peter has come from a very impressive line. <laughs> I tried to do that. I really did. <laughs> but today's text just gives us a very simple, profound truth. That whatever gains we've had, we can regard them as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus. That there's nothing more valuable. There's nothing more powerful. There's nothing more life-changing or honor-filled than knowing Jesus. There's really nothing. In a world where the brokenness of humanity is headline news on a regular basis, 
I wonder a lot, God, what am I supposed to say to the college students that I speak to? Or I wonder, God, I'm preaching this Sunday. What kind of new, shiny thing should I say in light of this world that we're in? And when I keep asking these questions, I come back to this simple answer that the message hasn't changed. As I read this text, I see that there's still nothing more valuable than knowing Christ. Each one of us, regardless of our pedigree or our achievements, are invited into a relationship with Christ to be saints together. May we be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from following a set of rules or seeking to earn a particular level of prestige or honor, but one that comes through faith. The message translation of the Bible says this, I don't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. So Paul continues, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And in a world where we feel like we've got things pretty figured out, let us remember that today. May we know Christ's resurrection power. May we understand that our works alone will not heal the brokenness of this world. But, but, there is power in Christ. And in Christ's resurrection, even death was conquered in the resurrection. Now, we may not always live this out perfectly. Paul, too, admits in the text, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal. He finds himself on the way, though. But that is no problem because of the old order because the old order of honor and achievement no longer counts. I'm going to cough. Hang on. <coughs> I've been struggling with my voice today. Um, that old order doesn't matter. Um, Paul, what Paul is doing here is actually bringing new vision into his tradition. <coughs> so he says, not that I have already obtained this, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. May we too be people bringing new vision into our traditions. I have a friend who's a trail runner. She's amazing. She runs, like, on her days off, to, for fun, she runs, like, 10 miles through the wilderness. Um, she's just stunningly athletic and a wonderful human. She was recently training for a 100-mile race through the Utah wilderness. And about seven weeks before her race, during one of her practice runs, she had a terrible fall on the trail. And um, in that fall, she completely dislocated her elbow and had massive lacerations. So she ended up in the hospital. And she was chronicling this on her social media. So many of us who are friends with her figured this race was done, that she wouldn't be running anymore. But what was surprising is she was so persistent. She ended up actually in physical therapy and she, they were stretching her arm back into place and helping her get back on her feet and a couple of weeks later actually she was back running on the trails she had a splint on her arm and she started running on the day of the hundred mile race um, which we thought she wasn't going to run she posted a video of her coming up on the finish line 
And she explained that she ran that race a lot slower than she was first expecting. She had to stop at one point in the race and she wasn't sure if she could go on because she was experiencing shin splits. And for the last 10 miles of the race, she ran on those shin splits. And as she crossed the finish line, she was recording herself and she could do nothing but cry the whole way over the line because she got across this finish line when she did not think that was going to happen. She pressed on. And today's scripture is a word of encouragement for us that in the midst of trials, in the midst of pain and in the face of unexplainable brokenness, that we are not called to lean into our own power. We're called to lean into Christ, each one of us. We're called to be the people that, cry, that God has, for, has created us to be. And we know that we're not perfect, but we can be perseverers. So press on. There may be days or seasons that are much more painful and difficult than others, but friends, press on. On. Lean into the power of your Savior who loves you so deeply and is calling you forward. I'm reminded of the words of a hymn written by the great hymn writer Fanny Crosby. Her story is really amazing to me. As a six week old baby, Fanny Crosby had an eye inflammation, and her regular physician was out of town, and so they called in a substitute physician. And that physician the treatment that he gave Fanny actually made her go blind for the rest of her life. She entirely lost her sight. And many people asked her if she was bitter about that. She said no, that she resolved at an early age to leave all care to yesterday and to believe that the morning would bring forth its own peculiar joy. A well-meaning minister once told her, that it was a pity that she didn't have her sight. And she responded, If at birth I had been able to make one petition of my creator, it would have been that I should be born blind. Why? asked the minister. And she replied, Because when I get to heaven, the first sight that, I, that shall ever gladden my eyes will be that of my Savior. And she wrote many hymns, Speaking of seeing her Savior face to face, but this one stands out to me as especially poignant. She says, When my life work is ended, and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him. I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages, I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. Friends, let us press on. Amen.